Yep. So this water cycle repeats itself three times, 120,000 years, incredible. Nat we all are very familiar with natural cycles, daily, weekly, yearly. But this 120,000, what, what you're going to see is the extraordinary um, mapping of this, this water, um, which is going to be part of this presentation. So when, we, when you have your bowls of water, Lake Mungo in, in this story is very much about water, even though it's a now dry lake. So I'm going to hand over to Ben. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much, Jenny. Thank you and welcome everybody. It's great to be here in the Sacred Land Sacred Sites room with uh, Jim and uh, Tanya. Thank you so much. Uh, and this is a very special program in so many different ways. As Jenny's just uh, touched on, um, this story has been a huge part of our family um, for my entire life. Uh, it's wonderful to have our brother Jason Kelly uh, uh, from the Muddy Muddy people. Jason's been such an extraordinary part of Unity Earth and is part of the Unity Earth Association here in Australia and uh, is uh, a living descendant of the Mungo peoples and story. So just for a few minutes to begin, um, Mungo is such a, a powerful, uh, mystical, uh, magical um, uh, place and story. So it's an incredible honor to be able to share it. And as you're going to hear, it's a place where science um, uh, spirituality, humanity and culture, water, land, people all come together. And uh, just to, I suppose, in the context of this moment in World Unity Week, um, share for a couple of minutes to, to those of you who, who, who may know and those of you who may not know, the, um, the, the fact that, water, that the Mungo story really has been the animating, spiritually sponsoring story uh, for everything that's happened with Unity Earth over this last 10 years. Um, uh, and, you know, going back to growing up uh, with uh, going out there with mum and dad, um, you know, hearing the mantras of my father drummed into me. Uh, you know, we have so much to learn from Aboriginal people. Uh, they have something that we've lost. Uh, this is the mantra that's sort of in my water, in my membrane, in all of our family. And, um, uh, and and just the power of that story of the, the ancientness, the mystery, 45,000 years ago, you'll hear today about those ceremonial uh, burials of Mungo Lady and Mungo Man, so the spiritual consciousness of modern humanity at 45,000 year, years ago on this, on this lake, which is now dry due to, the, due to the, you know, the geological ice age climate cycle. But just to really express, I cannot express how strongly this story has been with us uh, over this last years. Jason uh, and, and many others, you'll hear from Auntie Mary Pappen today. And Mary was the leader from a, of the elders at the time of the return to country of Mungo Man, where we in a humble way played a small role by putting on our celebration and brought Aboriginal leaders and dancers and musicians uh, from all over Australia and actually from across the world. Uh, Mindai, uh, Mindai uh, Bastido uh, and others were there um, and that return to country of Mungo Man really was an initiation for us on the road to 2020 and that spirit then came through Jason Kelly and Dane Kennedy to Ethiopia and to the Rift Valley and bringing this ancient story to the Rift Valley uh, which some narrative says the origin of all humanity the cradle of humanity so that's been with us all the way along. So to be here now in World Unity Week 2021 and to be presencing Mungo with Jason and Jim and Joan and Jenny um, and Janice, the five J's here that are doing this, uh, and Jim Greywolf, of course, who's hosting us. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's something very special. It's a very, very special moment and that uh, Dad and, and Mama are still well and strong to be with us. It's a, it's a great uh, honour and privilege. And, so here we go, the magic of Mungo, 50,000 year old story. Um, thank you, Jenny, and welcome, welcome, welcome everyone. And, and Ben, can I just get you to, um, uh, what I will say, we're about to share a video. Can you introduce Jeffrey Blaney? After, after this video, we're gonna have a welcome acknowledgement of country and incredible um, sharing from one of the descendants of the, of the elders there, the Muddy Muddy, Jason. Kelly, some of you might know him, and then a beautiful water blessing by one of his cousins, and we'll just keep rolling on through. So, Ben, if you could introduce Jeffrey Blaney. 
Sure. Well, I mean, Dad's probably the right person to know Jeff Jeffrey Blaney, but I'll do my best. Jeffrey Blaney is Australia's most eminent historian. I mean, he's written 40 or 50 books. Um, many of them have defined Australia's view of itself. Um, over decades and decades and decades, I guess he's in his late 80s or early 90s. Um, and we we're fortunate enough uh, through Charlie Porter's uh, generosity to capture him. And um, uh, here is a film that was made by Burning House, especially for this session today. Thank you. Go, Jim. Jim Bowler in the late 1960s, looking around a bit of deserted countryside came across human remains. They were the oldest human remains discovered in Australia up to that time, and they still remain the oldest human remains, and it's remarkable. It's one of the great events in, in Australian history, and it also has a place in world history. Uh, the mango story is so important for Australia. For a long time, the Europeans living in Australia believed that it was a land with no history, that Australia had virtually no history until the Dutch explorers came in the 17th century and until Captain Cook uh, toured the East Coast in 1770. But eventually it was realised that people had been living in this continent for an enormous length of time. Uh, originally it was thought that uh, the Aborigines perhaps came here sometime before the birth of Christ or sometime after. We thought it wasn't long ago. Suddenly, in the space of about 15 or 20 years, Jim Bowler's discovery of Lake Mango made it clear that the Aborigines had been here at least 24,000 years ago. And later researchers found that they were here 40,000 years ago, when the world was a completely different place to what it is today. Many people say, and, and, and I understand their view, that uh, these two human remains which were found at Lake Mungo should now disappear, that they should be scattered into the sand hills or into the soil of the country around Lake Mungo, and uh, that's the end of it, but uh, th that doesn't make sense uh, to take people who are symbolically so important and make them disappear seems to me to be an act of disrespect. They should be preserved because they are examples of the human race at that stage of history, but they're also so important for Aboriginal history. They're not only important for the people of Lake Mungo, but they're important for the historical understanding and the historical pride of Aboriginal peoples who live in the Northern Territory, or peoples who live in, very different peoples who live in the Torres Strait Islands, or Aboriginal peoples who live in Tasmania. These remains don't belong to a tiny little neck of the woods. They're universal. When we look at our history, there are certain uh, people, certain events, certain landscapes that uh, give us a, a sense of wonder and a sense that we belong to this land. And uh, whether it's Henry Lawson's short stories or Banjo Patterson's poems or whether it's the Heidelberg painters, there are certain people, certain events that make us feel we belong. And uh, Jim Boulder and Lake Mungo revolutionised our understanding of a vital part of the history, the human history of our homeland. Thank you, Geoffrey. Um, Jason, we're going to get go over to you now. I just have to, um, my computer is very slow. Stop sharing. Jason, can I pass on to you? Just making sure I'm unmuted. So hello, hello everyone. It's Jason Kelly, um, uh, muddy, muddy, wamba, wamba um, man. Um, first of all, what I'm going to do, I'm going to do a welcome and acknowledgement. And what I'm doing, I'm holding here a message stick. Now, a messy stick is like a traditional passport. So Australia is not, not an island. It's actually a continent made up of 250 different language groups and 400 different nations. And a messy stick was used when we travelled through the different, different nations. So in a way, I'm, I'm holding this on behalf of everyone and I'm welcoming everyone into, our, into my country. Without going in, into all of the um, symbols that are on this, I will tell you that on the top of it, there is Memori. That's our 
um, our ancestor spirit, our spiritual creator, um, to God, to some people. And then the bottom, it's all the traditional symbols for community. And we're all brothers and sisters from, you know, within a global global community. So we all, we all link. I'm going to talk, so I'm just going to do a, um, in, in the Muddy Muddy language, <clears throat> I'm going to welcome everyone into, into this space. So, Yiri Muddy Muddy Wam Wam with Tungi, Pukamana, Pingali Prembai, Yingi Ro Lara, Muddy Muddy Dangi, Yingi Yakarara, Kyaka Wood on the Middle, Kyakarara Pangur Pangur Murni, Yiri Akata, Ul Morurai, Yukajan Jerilium. So when I talk about Yukum and Julium, I'm talking about the dreaming and the dream time and um, first welcoming everyone in, into my country, paying my respects to my ancestors past and present, paying my respects to all of my Indigenous brothers and sisters all around the world. <clears throat> Chaka Wood in the Medal, acknowledging that we're all here as one united people. Um, also, I want to additionally, one thing I always do also um, is that uh, I always like to pay my respects to um, the children and our members of the stolen generations that, that happened here in Victoria. And I want to particularly give my condolences and pay special respects for what's, what's, been, what's happening and finding out what's happening over there in Canada and the, and the US with um, all of our, you know, all of our children, you know, Indigenous children that, that we're finding more and more of in, in un unmarked graves. So really... Um, that really affects all of us. Um, I'm going to um, talk a little bit about the, the dreaming and our relationship with the dreaming. So we, like all Aboriginal people, we're, we're, we're universal people and our dreaming doesn't actually have a separate he heaven from earth. We are connected to the universe and that's through our, our ground, our mother. And we are, and we link them with, you know, through our, the animals as our totems and our family um, to the sky, to the stars, to the sun, the moon. And our dreaming is very much as part of life and not just when we transfer over into the, into the spirit world. It's always with us. And it's there when we dance in our ceremony. So we are our totems. We are the animals that we are representing in those dances. And when we have ceremony, that's when our ancestors are there with us. Um, it's like there's no, there's no past or future. It's as if time stops, and we're all there in that one place, at that one time. And I think, like all Abr Aboriginal peoples all around and around the world, that's sort of how our our kinship system is really, really important. Also, um, and the kinship system. You know, is at the heart of, of I think of any Aboriginal society. So we understand our positions and our relationships to others and to the universe, and how that prescribes to our responsibilities towards other people and the land and the natural resources. It's just something that, as an Indigenous people, that we just we just do. I'm going to also I'm going to actually the one good thing about. Um, being the grandson of, of Alice Kelly, um, she not only walked with us, talked to us, taught us, she left a lot of written instructions also. So it's very easy. So I'm going to, I'm going to, um, I'm just going to go to something that Nan wrote about Mungo and how she describes Mungo. So Mungo is the dreaming place for muddy, muddy people. It is where our people come to hold ceremonies. Mungo is a place of love, peace, and harmony. For Muddy Muddy people, it is also the meeting place of the tribes, where we hold meetings, ceremonies, and trader things. The Muddy Muddy had a long association with the Rolandra Lakes and Mungo, long before the white settlers came through this country. The dreaming lines of Muddy Muddy are still there today, and also Barkindji and Nyampa. And so are those of the other tribes associated with the place. Mungo is the most cultural place as it reflects the past of the people and the land. It is a place that requires respect. It is a creation place where all things were brought into being. We realise today that this place, that this is the place where people and land become one, where our people walk with the spirits of our ancestors. 
Today, we look at this place and we belong. It is the place where all of our concerns and worries disappear. It has that effect on people. It is our most sacred site and demands respect. The future of Rolandra Lakes and Mungo National Parks relies on good management and respect of all those people that have association with it. The children and students must come to Mungo to learn and enjoy the spiritual and cultural significance of this, our most important place of our people, as this is the place of love, peace and harmony. So I think that just captures it beautifully and, and, and perfectly. Um, before I go back and talk any more about Mungo and the visions, do you want to do the water ceremony, Jenny, or do you want me to keep... Yeah, no, okay, let's see if you feel that's the way to go. I actually, I didn't have time to take a photo of that, but if you guys can see that photo, can you see that? That is um, that is Jason's grandmother, Alice Kelly, and we're going to hear from his auntie that's there as well, Mary Pappen, who's talking. Jenny, just hold it there. We're going to spotlight you. Just, just hang okay. on. Hold, hold it back. Try again. Hold it back. There you go. Yeah, go. There now. you go. So go that, that's, Jay, that's Alice Kelly. And, and her, one of her daughters, Mary, who's going to be sharing with um, mum a little bit later via video. And Alice was the first Aboriginal elder to approach the scientists going back nearly 50 years ago. And she used to, they say, so she used to walk around with a dictionary so she could understand what they were talking about. She's the most incredible woman, wasn't she, Jason? And he can, he can talk a lot more <laughs> about that. So we're, we're, we're going to share a video from um, Vicky, Jason's cousin, isn't it, Jason? Yep. Yep, and uh, a granddaughter of Alice. So here's the, um, let me share the screen. So Vicky is doing a water ceremony to, to welcome, to bring us all into the, to the heart and spirit of, of this land. The audio is a little bit difficult to hear. Hello to all my brothers and sisters right across the world. Here, we, here I am sitting on the sacred lands of the Wadi Wadi people who have been here for at least 60,000 years. And tonight I want to welcome you to my land. My grandfather's country is, is south of me, the Wamba Wamba people. And north of me is my grandmother's country, the Mati Mati people, from the very sacred lands of Lake Mungo. Traditionally, I would have a smoking ceremony to cleanse our session before, before we begin. But here in Australia, we have total fire ban days, and we cannot light fire. Even under cultural... Um, recognition or cultural purposes, we still cannot light fires for ceremonies. So I brought one of the most sacred things that we have to us as Aboriginal people, which is our water. Here is the land, here is the waterways that feeds the land of the Wadi Wadi Wamba Wamba Mutti Mutti people, the Murray River. And I've been gifted with the right to give people blessings of the water that comes from this giveaways. So as a way of starting our night of acknowledging Lake Mungo, I bless you all with the water from the Great Murray River. The, the river that sustains us, the river that sustains our land, the river that sustains our animals, that feeds us. The river that connects us to all that has been. The river is the vein of the Mother Earth. So I bless you with the great waters of the Murray River here on my grandfather's country. We'll stop. Thanks, Vicky. Over to you, Jason. My computer just takes a second to... 
Sure. So we've heard um, the, a bit about how Nan and how Mungo and, and what it means to us, but what it means for, for everyone. And because like Nan talks about, um, Mungo is a place that you've got to go to experience. It has a, a message for, for everyone and it speaks to everyone in, individually. So since Mungo Man and Mungo Lady f um, found Jim, like Nan, Nan used to say, um, we've had um, groups out there, the free traditional tribal groups have come to there and sort of gone into a, a joint management over the last 40 years, but it hasn't really been a joint, a joint management. There's been a continual aspirations, Aboriginal aspirations and voices out there calling for um, keeping place an international education centre rather than a culture centre, but Nan used to like to describe it as an in, in, in international education centre. So in, in May 2000, the elders again once got together and started talking about, do we want a keeping place? And the overwhelming answer from the elders of the Barkati, Muddy Muddy and Mayampa, um, you know, in May 2000 was yes, again. And I'm going to go through just some of the stuff, but I'm actually going to go to some of the minutes that, that came from there to really tie it in. Um, and what we'll talk, what came out is that the elders wanted to, wanted to keep material that had been collected from Melandra Lakes over the years. And they wanted to make sure that, that it was something that was owned by the free traditional tribal groups. And the elders were back to that stage, wanted to go around and see other places that, that were happening around Victoria um, and Australia um, that, to sort of like, get an idea of what, what would it look like. So, and what we wanted out of that was to, they needed a, a culture centre keeping place to house cultural material already at Mungo. They needed to have, they felt we needed to have an area for display and interpretation. Needed to house cultural material currently held in Willandra and surrounds. Need to house culture material held by other institutions, universities, uh, and researchers, and museums. One of the base, and still one of base for the free traditional tribal groups from work from a base for world for a world heritage team, um, and a team of world heritage rangers who might be cultural rangers and or educators and, and teachers. We we're looking wanting um, a hands-on centre for elders to be involved in, and at the um, free traditional tribal groups as people should be, always be visible. Needed something that needed to be properly professionally um, ad administered. Needed to have research facilities for people to work on Rolandra and material for here in Rolandra and even maybe the higher facilities. But it was really, really important. That was one thing that kept coming back that it needed to be an education center and that culture and the language of the free traditional tribal groups um, need to be archived and, 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 and archive and centred as well. And for the Rolandra Lakes, um, I guess it's more about, because one thing always with Mungo and Mungo Lady and Mungo Man was always talked about, they, they, they came for future generations and they were there for future generations. And we talked about the, the building must be sympathetic to the environment and sympathetic and built in um, sympathetic architecture. And then there was talks about um, video projection facilities. And we needed to have an individual space for each of the three individual tribes. So we're talking about meeting rooms, education rooms, accommodation, um, but most importantly for the three traditional tribal groups to own and run the facility. And training required in a range of activities um, and training required to create materials to, you know, to professional standards. So these are things that we kept coming back to and presenting over and over and over as a vision um, and in line with self-determination. And then only just recently again in 2018, we revisited those aspirations again. And the three traditional tribal groups, because um, now I've come up back onto sit with the elders on the actual free traditional tribal groups. And somewhere along the line in the, in the, in the years since we had joint management, our names have even changed 
they changed our names from the Free Traditional Tribal Groups to the Aboriginal, um, Aboriginal Advisory Group. And then with that, so we sit there as a voice um, with our aspirations again, like we have for the last 40 years, 50 years, going back, dealing with all the government agencies who actually have the management and we have, well, they say we have, we have joint management. So we had another meeting 2018 and we again passed another resolution to pursue our aspirations and that we were to write a letter to the federal minister again around these aspirations. And some of it was talking about the education centre, the International Education Centre. And we described it to the minister as such a centre would not only be a place to showcase the richness of Australia's Aboriginal history, it also be a place of healing, a gift to the world that all Australians can be proud of, and a further step towards I wouldn't say reconciliation. I like to use the word transformation because transformation is much more meaningful. I think all Indigenous peoples across the world agree is much more meaningful a term from reconciliation. And it's like a lot of our elders um, say, when you're looking at the histories of colonisation, effects of colonisation, how do you reconcile genocide? So we're looking to, as a step towards transformation. And it was our aspirations to allow for the showcasing of the rich history of the free tribal groups of Mungo for all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people of Australia. It will also allow space for the Muddy Muddy, Bark and Jinampa peoples to show the world um, that we're not just defined by our past, rather that we are still there and forever will be, and further inspire us to reach our potential in accordance with the high expectations of the United Nations Declaration of Rights and Indigenous People as a free traditional tribal owner groups um, to also honour our ancestors, our past, our present and our future. So, but our experience, and sadly with our experience, even with Australia um, agreeing to sign, because Australia was one of the four nations that actually initially voted against UNDRIP, but even with Australia signing a commitment to UNDRIP, and we have the UNESCO policy for engagement with Indigenous peoples, and that's been known and it's stated that it's accepted by the government agencies out there like New South Wales Parks and Wildlife Service, the Office of Environment um, of Heritage, and then we have also have the Rolandra Lakes Region World Heritage um, Area Advisory Committee, and that's a full committee made up of the three TG members, scientists, landowners, local government, tourism, um, parks and wildlife, fossil fire and heritage. So we even still to experience impediments to achieving self-determination. Unfortunately, we are probably like a lot of Indigenous peoples around the world. We continue to experience bureaucratic processes imposed on us. And that's ensured that management, the government management, has always had control and continues to maintain control. But control is contrary to self-determination. So in these arrangements, Aboriginal people, Aboriginal interests, probably like us, same as everyone else around the world, um, and aspirations are marginalised and, and co-opted and serve the broader interests probably of the state. And all too often we experience the important issues to us being quickly taken over by and assimilated into the bureaucratic systems for refinement and control purposes and away from us and our communities. So it's great that we've got this and we're sending this message around the world too, and we're having the friends, um, friends of friends of Mungo, um, because we're talking about, um, you know, we still have the aspirations for that centre. We have the aspiration still to have Mungo Man and Mungo Lady with with, with memorials um, and a place of, you know, this this education centre and, and those visions. And we seek internet. We seek a lot of support in trying to still realise those aspirations and realise what it is in UNDRIP and the United Nations Declarations of Rights of Indigenous Peoples and UNESCO policy for engagement with Indigenous people. Because one thing that's really frustrating for us is we've got a UNESCO World Heritage Park where, and we're not able to experience the, the high expectations of UNDRIP or UNESCO policy then if we can't achieve that there at a place called Mungo for the free traditional tribal groups then what hope has anyone anyone else got um, 
you know, in our Indigenous, Aboriginal families or Indigenous families here right, right around, all right around the world. But I, I want to talk a little bit about transformation, um, but maybe I might just so, go... So can, we, can we come back to that transformation at yep. the back end of it after everyone's had a chance to see... Yeah, the I'll everyone have a chance. Yeah, a good idea, because then I want yeah, to tell let, the story about the muscles. In, let's get people... Oh, yeah, that would be so beautiful, um, especially after they've seen photos of them. Is that Okay. So do you want to just finish there what you're saying and we'll come back? Oh, I reckon I have finished because I'm just going to, when we get the, to the end, I just want to talk about our story, the, the muddy, muddy story about the, the, um, the freshwater mussels and how beautiful. it's about two becoming one. That would be so beautiful. Jace, can you introduce mum and, and your and, Aunt, and Auntie Mary? Can you introduce my mum, Joan and Aunty oh, Mary? Sure, yes, yes. So now we're going to have the wonderful, wonderful, um, like, um, Joan Bowler and my um, my dad's sister, Aunty, Aunty Mary, also known as Aunty Tookie in the family. Okay, mum. So Thank this, you. Is, this is obviously mum and dad at Mungo. What I will say, mum, just before you start, as some, some of you might be starting to notice, there's a theme here. There's two families really coming together in this conversation. You hear Jason and his grandmother and his aunties and his cousins and this powerful young man um, coming with such knowledge and, and presence and wisdom. And then we, we have this other family that, you know, a conversation that was started over 50 years ago with my dad and my mother and Ben and myself and our children go out there. So just so you're aware, we have a parallel story going on here of Indigenous and non-Indigenous in this landscape. Mum? Thank you. Oh, thank you, Jenny. Yes, thank you, Jason. And wonderful to hear what you're saying and so, so, so important. Um, just to carry on the theme for a minute, um, I mean, here's my glass of water to uh, honour water. And water, of course, is tasteless, colourless, it's uh, transparent, and yet it is the, the lifeblood of all, for, for the planet and all the species in it. And, and it's, it's extraordinary. So when I look at Vicky and sitting uh, on the banks of the Murray River, it reminds me every time I see that, of course, as a young, I was born in, uh, in an, um, a small country town on the Murray River, the same river that uh, that Vicky's talking about. And she's about five hundred kilometres away from from where where I was born. And 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 as as a little kid, the power of the river, it, it was all part of our life. We swam there, we fished there. There were droughts. The river was dry, and of course there were floods. So the river is in my veins as well. And uh, as I say, you can take the child to the city, but you can't take the, 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 the country out. I've got that all wrong. But anyway, you can take the, the country kid to the city, but you can't take the country out of the child. Those experiences stay with you. That's really what I'm trying to say. In terms of going to Mungo and to, and to Mary Papin, um, because the a continuation of water from my experiences as, as a kid, and then getting involved with Mungo, of course, which is all originally started with water. And, um, and as various people have said, Jenny and Ben, um, our family have been, in, in, you know, in, in, I was going to say embroiled, but that's not, that's not the word. We've been engrossed in this story for 50 years. And to, as said by Ben and Jenny, you know, we're privileged to, to be part of this extraordinary um, wonderful part of Australian history. Um, and in terms of the, my own experience with the Indigenous people at Mungo, I, um, I've been going out there for many, many years. And, and, and of course, the, the Indigenous people or the Aboriginal people were not living on that property when Jim discovered, as um, Geoffrey Blaney showed us, it was quite barren. It was a country property. And they, they suffered from big droughts and all sorts of um, weather factors. And um, so most of the um, Aboriginal people were in, around, the little, around the edges of, of, of urban cities or urban country towns. So when it changed after the discovery, 
uh, they they too were going back to to their own country um, for the first time because they were their, their ancestors had been removed from the country. These their children or the children that are now the the elders uh, have not had that experience of being on country until this uh, event has happened and 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 they were able then to come to come back and claim. Their, their rightful place. So my, I won't go on talking because Mary's coming up and she's a marvelous, marvelous woman. And, and, and so all the other indigenous people I've met out at Mungo from the three tribes, uh, just beautiful, warm, caring, um, and, and very uh, keen to have their, their story told. And uh, so Jenny, if you would like, and. And of course, I'll just talk about my own children. Uh, they've all had um, they've all had uh, experiences with Mungo, and it's uh, uh, you know they've had their ups and downs with various things with uh, with uh, time, and uh, their dad been a bit absent, but you know sometimes things draw you to a greater need, and so we're all very pleased and and gracious to give Jim that time. Thank you, Jenny. Okay, so we will go to the to a video, a beautiful video that was made just in the last few weeks with um, Mum speaking to Mary, really about the current issues that are happening uh, at Mungo. Can you see my screen? Did I push the right button? No, we can't see you. Okay, thanks. Sorry, I just got distracted saying who Mary was. Um, there we go. Uh, a little bit, what's going on here? Sorry. Okay. I'm Mary Pappen. I belong to the Muthi Muthi people and Alice Kelly was my mother. And through the, through the years, she was a great inspiration for us to make sure that we looked after country, walked in country, and made sure that our future generations would know about our cultural heritage on the ground. Uh, Mungo National Park was such a place where we, where we went, where she was very much involved, and we just went from there in, in uh, leaps and bounds to um, talk about cultural heritage, save it, protect it, and work with it. But somewhere along the line, we got overstepped and it most likely would have been governments that stuck their mags in because I believe they wanted it all for themselves. They didn't want to share nothing. When we preached to them that Mungo was a sharing place for all Aboriginal people and all walks of life. And we want to preserve our stuff that's on the ground. It and you think that the keeping place would be also the site where the Mungo lady and Mungo man would go back in the ground? Of and course, be because there. then we got them right there. We we know where they are all the time. Then. So, what difference does it make to you? Do you think in your story, if 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 this goes ahead and they and they're placed back anonymously and nobody knows where they are, what well, do you think? Well, we've what lost we, we've lost all contact with our people that came up for us in the first place fifty years ago. They came up out of the ground 50, because because they no, this is when they just come up. Yeah, that's right. When they just come up You're back in the, back in the sixties, they come up because they knew the struggle with Aboriginal Australia and Aboriginal people in making their way in society, but not getting recognised. And they, our Aboriginal people, need to recognise who they are, where they're coming from, and what culture they, you know, they are to survive in this landscape. Now you have to be. You have to know who you are and what you, what what you belong to, so that you can preserve it for the next generation, like our old people did, sixty thousand years ago. You know, if they had a if they had a sold out, like even forty thousand years ago, where would we be? They hung on to that cultural heritage and that landscape for us. And what, what's happened to us? We're fighting, we're fighting against everything to keep our cultural heritage going on the ground. We can't even get into our into country 
because they put fences up to stop us. Unless you're there for a reason, they don't want you there. I so, Mary, you're calling for what would you like to see uh, when Mungo Man and Mungo Lady are returned to the soil, are reburied? What would you, what, what's your vision? What would you like to see? They can't go back in the ground until after we get our keeping place because that was the idea of making sure that the keeping place was going to be the place where they should go back in the ground behind the keeping place in that landscape. That's where it was going to be. And, you know, we didn't want them locked away and buried so that they could never ever be seen again. We want them there where we knew they were safe, where we could keep an eye on them and look after them. But we also knew, knew we'd need them one day to uh, explain to the rest of the world just how precious these people were to us in showing the rest of the world that our landscape was older than, you know, the millennium. We were, we were so proud of those two people and there's more out there. I uh, admire Mary's courage and position of Don't authority. forget about the passion of my people. <laughs> And her, 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 her um, attitude to, to um, recognising her mother's uh, importance in this whole story and the other Indigenous groups who are uh, in this landscape. But I think Mary and her passion for others to be informed other than Indigenous people is so vital, especially, I believe, Mary, that these wonderful people are, are, are national treasures to all of us. They are some beacon of light and hope, Mungo Man and Mungo Lady, of course. as a way of honouring the Indigenous or the First Australians or the original people here in, in Australia. And I, I support you and honour you and your group to do what you feel is best for your people. Thank you, Janie. Thank you. You just sound like your old husband. <laughs> what would be your biggest concern if this goes ahead and those bones are put back and nobody knows where they are and they're, 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 they're secret and forgotten to the rest of the world? Well, I don't think they're ever going to be secret to me. But um, they will be losing their cultural identity. Our Aboriginal people will lose their cultural identity to say, this here is where our old people walked. This here is where we can teach our younger ones in future years. This here is our cultural heritage place. We will share this with you, but you've got to be willing to share with us too and have a bit of compassion for our Aboriginal people who suffered and died on this landscape when you first come here. I mean, after, after another hundred years, there probably won't be no hardly any landscape. There'll be just a big dust bowl. I don't know, but that's not going to be any good to my great, 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 great grandkids, if you know what I mean. I mean, we only have a 50 or, or 70 year lifespan and then the next generation takes over. Well, how many more do you think we're gonna have? How many more are we gonna be able to say this is a cultural heritage place of Aboriginal Australia if they can't go and learn it from there? Because there's, there might be other places, but that's the big book out there and the sand slowly blows and brings more. I mean, there we got the footprint side. There we had Mungo Lady, there we had Mungo Man, and others are coming up. You know, they're not for the taking, they're to be, if they are, to be protected, but also in a safe place. And a keeping place is our place that we need to have. Other black fellows have keeping places in country, why can't we have one? 
Thank you, Mary. And what a profound place to finish that on that, that question. You know, how many more generations are coming? What's the landscape going to look like? And just while I get out my video, my, my computer's slow, we're about to um, introduce a distinguished scientist recognised for, for his work globally, who is my father, Ben's father, Jim Bowler, uh, who has been in conversation as a scientist, as an earth scientist, as a climate change scientist, at Lake Mungo for over 50 years with the traditional people. And um, we are now going to enter into the landscape at Mungo and have the extraordinary opportunity to look at and be introduced to Mungo Lady and Mungo Man. So, Dad, if you can, um, I'll pass it over to you. And I'll, I'll stop sharing. Sorry, my screen is so slow. But, Dad, off to you. Um, and Jenny, friends, uh, you know, it's uh, such a privilege uh, to come. Dad? Yeah. We can't hear you very well. Can you take the earplugs out? I'll, I'll, I'll unmute me. Is that any better? That's yeah, good. unmute. That'll work. Okay. Well, it is a, a privilege to... Uh, come in the um, footsteps of Jason and, and, and Mary Pappen, uh, to whom I owe a great debt, and particularly a debt to their ancestral people, uh, the Mungo people who uh, came to my attention and with whom I share the privilege of learning to know so much about the ancient Australians, about their land and their culture. And that's what I would just try to share with you um, briefly now. Jenny, I, I will just uh, uh, stress that I, I'm a, a, a geologist, I'm not an archaeologist, and I was um, really bent on trying to understand the history of landscape. In, in Australia we have deserts, uh, lots of fossil dunes, but no, no active deserts. We've got lots of, 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 of lakes, but no water. So these were evidence of big change in the past. And it was uh, the unknown story of the Ice Age, unlike North America, where you had great ice sheets um, to remind people of what it was like 20,000 years ago. We've ha we had no ice of that nature in Australia. So I was trying to understand how we had all these ancient basins uh, once were lakes. Where is the water gone? So it was on that context that I was setting out to use those ancient basins as the key to understanding the water, as a key to understanding the climate. So that was where my story began. And if we go through the videos, Jenny, I'll, I'll uh, 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 just explain step by step just where we were and how we came into contact with those uh, early Australians. Firstly, the uh, this aerial shot of the southern margin of Lake Mungo, uh, the, on, the, on the left, the dry lake uh, basin, uh, the shoreline, uh, the, the site of the sandy dunes. And, uh, and of course, it's, it's on the, when the water was there, um, it was on the shoreline that people were camping, just as we do in holiday makers today. You uh, run to the beach and, and have a picnic on the shoreline. Well, I was finding evidence of stone tools and the shells and uh, uh, features that pre presented me with the evidence of people here at a very, uh, very ancient antiquity, um, older than we had understood. Uh, when I uh, took this story back to my archaeology colleagues in Canberra, they said, no, Bowler, uh, there were no people there during the last ice age 20,000 years ago. Um, you, you're a geologist, you stick to your stones. So I stuck to my stones, but eventually I found bones in my stones. And it was the finding of bones here at Mungo Lady um, as we, uh, this unlikely block of, uh, of soil carbonate, like a lump of concrete, uh, evidence of an old soil. And from that, there were traces here of bones. We'll come back to them in a moment. But that, that was the shoreline of the eroding uh, lake 
Uh, we knew that the dates were at least 20,000 years. And on that, uh, the, the, the next shot, Jenny, that uh, from, the, uh, from the reconstruction of those bones, my uh, physical anthropologist, Alan Thorne, the, put together the fragments of burnt bones to produce the skull, the, the, the cranium of, uh, of, of a young, young woman who had been cremated. These were the fragmental remains of a cremation. We knew at 20,000 years, it was already the oldest cremation in the world. But the surprising thing was that uh, while people have been trying to prove in the past that ancient uh, humans were uh, bore uh, resemblance to Neanderthals, and they weren't modern like us. But this cranium from Mungo Lady proved, and you match with a modern cranium, match, they are perfectly symmetrical. This was the, the remnants of a young lady just like us, a fully modern lady. And meanwhile, Thomas Huxley in Cambridge was a friend of Charles Darwin, was still trying to prove that ancient Aboriginal people had connections to Neanderthal people. This was the answer to Thomas Huxley. No sign of Neanderthals. These were fully modern people. And at 20, 30, and now 40,000 years ago, fully modern in Australia. So that uh, the fragments from which those, uh, those were discovered, Jenny, uh, were the, the next slide, uh, just these fragments of burnt bones. So it was an amazing piece of detective reconstruction uh, to produce that evidence. And that was the end of what had been uh, 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 scientifically a phase of grave robbing. Many graves were robbed, the bones were sent across, across the world. They were sent to Cambridge where Thomas Huxley was working on Australian bones to try and prove they were related to Neanderthal. This was the answer to all of that scientific um, uh, uh, indignity that had been visited on Aboriginal people. Uh, and move on, Jenny, the next. Um, the, that was that was in 1960, 69, 68, 69. Five years later, the tip of cranium was just becoming visible on a, a site uh, next to uh, Lake Mungo. Jenny, next. Um, just 400 metres away on the same eroding landscape, my <clears throat> archaeological colleagues came from Canberra and scraping away the sand, they revealed this articulated remains of, uh, of the next, of what we see, Jenny, next, of this amazing uh, exposition of a fully articulated, turns out a male, uh, about, the, about the same size as me, a large man, and uh, but buried here, the, the sand dunes, the sand grains were dated at 40,000 years. The grave was dug and infilled around the margin of those remains 40,000 years ago. But the amazing thing was that as we we're uncovering these remains, my colleagues point to say, hey, look, we're, we're pellets of something here. There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a pink stain on this part of the grave. What is it? With a, a careful look at it. And it proved to be the mineral ochre, uh, hematite, uh, iron oxide, that red uh, signal of blood that is used so symbolically in, uh, by, uh, by indigenous people the world over today, ochre. There is no ochre in this area for hundreds of kilometers. The ochre had to be imported. The next, Jenny. And a this photograph, a Polaroid on the day of excavation, not quite as good quality, but it shows the evidence here of a large fireplace, a large fire simultaneously with the excavation of the grave. So here we had the ritual, uh, the, the sim symbolism of red ochre anointing the body and the ritual fire. Now, as, as Jason Kelly has reminded us, uh, that fire is used by Aboriginal people today as the cleansing, uh, the, 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 the cleansing agency. 
And fire here was used 42,000 years ago with ochre. Now that degree of ritual uh, ceremony of the dead, it's the type of the type of rites that would be appropriate in any cathedral today. Here we are on the shores of Lake Mungo 40, 42,000 years ago to find that ritual organization carried out by a community who are obviously highly organized, highly articulate, and able to coordinate the introduction of the ochre. It had to be ground into a paste or paint and sprinkled or painted on the body. And the ceremony of fire, the sort of religious ceremony that we uh, would equate with spiritual connection today. This is the connection of people to the environment. They, the people, the community of burial here were spiritually connected to the, to the land they lived in. You don't just you had to go and find the ochre, bring it in, organize the fire, bring all these, these symbols together. Symbols of what? They are symbols of spiritual connection to country. Now that's the connection that Jason Kelly and Vicki Clark has shared with us today. It's a connection of what we would relate as, a, as, a, as a, essentially a religious connection. And it's one which uh, has a, tr in, a important uh, resonance to us today. We of the, uh, the scientific world, we upset the Aboriginal people by, by taking those remains away without their permission. Uh, they, they pointed out to us, uh, that is their history, not ours. They said to us, you've got Captain Cook, you've still got Queen Elizabeth, you've got your English history. You leave, leave our history to us and you stick with your, your British ancestral story. So that was a story of uh, a phase of, of, uh, of confrontation. But we sat down with the elders out there on the shores of Lake Mungo and agreed that we must collaborate. They learned something from science. Science, scientists, we were in the process of learning from them. So the two groups sat down, each to learn from the other. And that's where we are today. Mungo man and Mungo lady, they have come back to tell us their stories. They have messages, the messages of Bungo Man. Uh, they resonate with us. What have you done to our land? What have you done to our people? And that's the message that we must take heart today. We live in this now cosmic awareness of the origin of consciousness, where, where land, life came from rocks. Consciousness came to this earth only about modern people 250, 30,000 years ago. Here they were in Australia, certainly before 40, before 60,000 years, modern people with messages for us today. That's the, the message we take away. What have we done to their land? And now in the impact of, of, of um, modern uh, consumer attitude to the landscape, uh, we're reminded in by the uh, story of climatic, the threat of climatic change, and the words of Laudato Si, Pope Francis has reminded us, what have we, what have we done for humans to, to, to contaminate the earth, to contaminate its waters, its land, its air, its life? These are sins. We are learning from the Aboriginal people in the past how they lived and cared for the land, we today have much to learn from them. Oh, thank you, Dad. It's, um, uh, Dad, Dad has been inside of this story for 50 years. I don't know if, if everyone on the call with us now or watching later can just have in their own imagination, imagine how you would feel uncovering that uh, coming face to face with that ancestor over 40,000 years old, Mungo Man clearly was so dramatic. Mungo Lady is incredible that they even were able to recognize her. So, Dad, your work is, 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 is extraordinary and, and it's just a great opportunity that people around the world now are starting to hear this story.
um, just to give a context, I take some of this work into schools and it's very difficult for us to understand the, um, the time span, 40,000, 50, 60,000 years. But to give you an idea, 40,000 years is probably about 2,000 generations. There's five or six, seven generations in Australia. I'm not sure how many in America. So we're talking 20 to 2,000 plus, and that's only 40,000 years. You can probably double that here. The moon, it's a full moon at the moment. The moon cycle, monthly moon cycle would be 450,000 cycles of that moon going back to Mungo Man and Mungo Lady. So extraordinary time scale. And having been around this story and immersed and brought up in a household where your father is probably in an altered state since that happened and been in some other realm, um, you know, my, my journey has been a little bit about trying to explore, explore some of that and uh, many things that I've come through and learnt. And I just want to share a little bit. I'll share a little, a few images from, from Mungo and in particular, um, some of the things that I've got to, to learn through the journey. So when, when we go out to Mungo, people can go to Lake Mungo and some people will say they don't see anything and others will have their life completely changed. And for people, for many of you, I'm sure you relate to that um, sacred sites and earth and energy and you know what we see and what we can feel and experience. One of the elders on another video, another video we have, she says out at Mungo, it's space and it's just peaceful. And I think that's the thing when we're coming into that Indigenous, Aboriginal, listening to Indigenous people just slows my mind down. I mean, I love it. So Aboriginal culture has taught us to be still and to wait. We do not try to hurry things up. We let them follow their natural course like the seasons. We watch the moon in each of its phases. We wait for the river to fill, we wait for the rain to fill our rivers and water the thirsty earth. When twilight comes, we prepare for the night. At dawn, we rise with the sun. So, so many of us in our Western culture obviously are, are out of those rhythms. But when you go to Mungo, it's incredible. And I, and I like many of the, the, the incredible landscapes and stories you're all sharing with Unity Earth all this, this week, but out there, it's, it's, it's transcendent. You, there are no buildings, there are no, there's nothing. You have to expand your mind. You have to enter into a transpersonal realm that's greater than the, the ego or the uh, ordinary waking consciousness to, to connect to this time span. So um, automatically we're changed just by being in that presence and learning to listen, as somebody mentioned earlier before, just listening and letting the land speak to you. And I, while we're here, I want to honour and pay my respects to these elders and the, the descendants of, of um, the Mati Mati, Niampa and Barkindji people whose story it is that we're, we're looking and sharing. And I also want to honour the Indigenous people who are with us today, or this evening, and, and for everyone else that is here and to recognise where we're actually meeting in this virtual landscape yet we're able to touch and feel uh, energetically these extraordinary experiences. And having been around a little bit of Aboriginal culture and listening to Dad and the spirituality that was established 40,000 years ago, how many moon cycles, how much evolving of consciousness, of wisdom, of knowledge, the sophistication of Aboriginal people is, is spiritual sophistication is extraordinary. And so their ability to share messages, they didn't need the internet. That, you know, it was just so much, so, so sophisticated. Yet we're connecting globally. Like I know Teya Deshadan is one of dad's mentors, you know, that's, as, as many people, the noosphere, a global wrap around our globe. But traditional people have this extraordinary power and knowledge. And I think so many of us are trying to reconnect to those elements. So I guess on my journey, that's some of where I've come to. I've spent quite a bit of time around Aboriginal communities and I realised I'm projecting a lot onto Indigenous people and I needed to find something inside of my own tradition that took me back to some kind of transcendent experience, which I'm going to share with you. But before we do, I just want to... 
for you to see a little bit more what, what we see when we go to Mungo. On the top right is a fireplace. That's an ancient fireplace, 36,000 years old, 30 to 40,000 years old, sitting there. The lifestyles of people 40,000 years ago are just popping up out of this sand dune. The sand dune itself is actually the shape of a lunette. It's called a lunette. It's the shape of a crescent moon, and it wraps around this lake. So the la it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a source place. The lake holds its story. The lake and, the, the, and the, the, the geology, the rise and fall of the water, the clay that has held these secrets here and they've been exposed for us to see right now. On that bottom right is the mussel shells that Jason's going to talk about. You can see them embedded in the sand dune as they, as they come up and the tools, the fire. So you can see a little bit more clearly how this looks like a, a lunette, a moon, a crescent moon. And it's a very powerful, peaceful, transcendent landscape. So what I'd like to just show you a little bit at the beginning of this um, presentation, I did mention the, the 120,000 um, year water table. The numbers aren't actually on this graph, but on the left-hand side is where we are currently, going all the way back to the right where it says wet, warm, wet, is 120,000 years ago. And that actual rising fall of that water has repeated itself three, three times in the last 500,000 years as a natural cycle, as an ice age cycle. Back on the left, we going into that big dip was 20,000 years ago. That was the peak of the ice age. That's a, that water is 120 meters lower than what it is today. So when you show these to school children or in schools or education, clearly climate change is not a debatable issue. Yet we have the human impact, as we know, that is for the first time changing climate. So Mungo offers us not just the human story, but the story of the landscape and evolution. And it's an incredible coming together of both of land and people. A Mungo lady, Mungo man, when kids get the context for the environment, how did they survive? In Australia, it was a cold desert. How did people survive that? I mean, I, from what I understand, not many people around the globe survived that that period. But here they are out at Mungo. Um, kids go out there regularly with school groups. And what, what I want to do now is just begin to see if we can share and take a bit of a deeper dive here just collectively into the, into the energy of, of the ancestors. And, and when we talk about ancestors, we, we have people that we're very clearly connecting to here with Mungo Lady and Mungo Man but just honouring where it is that you're sitting, what country you're on, what land you're on, well, who are your elders in your local community. And I'm going to play some music and imagery, music, imagery, stories, symbols, earth connections. These are, you know, more Indigenous ways of learning and looking, feeling, listening. Um, and we're going to share a little bit of that for you to take a deeper dive and just to really connect energetically with where you are now as a gift from the energy of, of Mungo. Just so you know that both Mungo Lady and Mungo Man were returned to the elders and, and these are the issues Jason and Mary are currently talking to. And these are some more of Jason's family and relations out there. So let's, I wanna share a beautiful um, uh, piece of music that an imagery from um, a movie called First Footprints here in Australia. And this is an opportunity for you to um, just give yourself two or three minutes to just drop into this experience and we'll come back after that. Um, here we go. So if you can just begin to feel comfortable in the chair that you're in and, and let the music and, and image just take you on, on a journey here. Are you seeing that screen? Yep.
and be aware of what it is that you're feeling in your body, your mind, your heart, your soul, your connection. Just stay in that energy. Stay with that because I'm about to share another piece of music and I want you to, to enter into this landscape with your eyes shut oh. and see what it is that you hear or feel. Just This is oh, a gift. Jenny, uh, into the landscape with your bloody eyes shut. <laughs> see, we're dealing with the scientists here. Thanks, Dad. You better keep mute.
heat in your body, the coolness in the skin. And coming back now into the room together. And I'm going to actually pass on to um, Janice. So we've been very blessed to be able to share this journey with uh, Janice, who I met on the Unity Earth um, conversations and was introduced to by my mum. And Janice has been working with us to, to bring all this together. And so, so much gratitude, Janice, and, and joy in, in meeting you and working with you. And it's really, we really look forward to hearing how this experience is for you and for, for people in other parts of the world who are only just starting to hear and connect to this story. But I will say that Janice knew about Dad before she had heard of Ben. So Janice has been connected to this story for a long time. Janice, over to you. I've been fascinated by Aboriginal people for quite some time. I don't know exactly when it started, but I sensed that they knew things that I did not know, but I desperately wanted to know. I somehow knew that they were multidimensional people. And, and, and I, I had a lot of pain for them and their sufferings, the brutal colonialism that also affected the Native Americans here in the United States. And I, I just felt a deep, um, uh, a deep pain for them. And I'm kind of a scientist wannabe, you know. So I, 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 I read about uh, Mungo Man and um, about Jim Boulder and Baller, excuse me, and he became sort of a science hero to me years ago. And I really felt um, the struggle that he had in finding um, these bones and bringing them back to the scientists in the museum there. And I think it took, I don't forget how long, was it 20 years? A long time before he was able to overcome the struggles of being able to get them back from the scientists and bring them back to country. And I, and I was very touched by his um, a personal passion for his learning about uh, the culture of Aboriginal people and, and their needs. And that, that really, really touched me. And um, for someone who studied geology and climate change um, for a few decades, this was before I met Ben and Joan and uh, Jim and um, Jenny and Marianne and uh, the whole family who has lived this story. So it was sort of a dream come true to me to meet my um, science heroes here and the whole entire family that um, I had been involved in this from various different aspects. And um, it seems that uh, I, I then what happened was over the past year, for some reason, all of a sudden I started meeting a lot of Aboriginal people separate from the Bowler family. And so it helped me to dive deeper into the story and deeper into trying to understand their culture a little bit. And I remember I'm going to read this part. One of the articles I read years ago, well, I read about the struggle that happened when they brought the bones back. And there were families who wanted those bones to be buried into oblivion so they would be just honored by scattering them to the winds or burying them deep in the ground so no one can touch them. And then there were families who uh, wanted to be in touch with that cultural heritage. And personally, I felt this just passion for, oh my goodness, we can't bury those bones because they mean so much. The Aboriginal people have been um, treated so horribly, cultural genocide. I said, this is a way to show people that this was a very sophisticated culture that predated all the cultures that we thought were sophisticated. Keeping those bones in a memorial gives future generations and the rest of the world an understanding of a culture that may be more sophisticated than we are. And I think it's really important. And one, one of the things that struck me in an article was, and it turns out Mary Pappin, Mungo Man was very clever because he revealed himself to a man of science. He thought Dr. Bowler would be the ideal person to make white Australia understand just how long us Aboriginal people have been here. So I say as I learn from Aboriginal people about their dreaming because 
they don't just talk about their ancestors, they talk to them. They feel them, they see them. They're informed in their everyday actions by their ancestors. So if in fact that is true, then why didn't they, if they wanted these remains to be buried forever, why didn't Mungo Man and Mungo Lady reveal themselves to an Aboriginal person from that tribe? Why did he choose Jim Bowler? That's a good question. And for me, I'll tell a little story. One of the days that I was speaking with uh, Ben and Joan from Mildura, they were kind enough to call me and update me on the, the struggles of whether to bury these bones or not. And I almost kiddingly said, well, I'm going to go to bed and I'm going to ask Mungo Man what he thinks. And I did. And I woke up. Before I woke up the next morning, I had a dream. And in that dream, I saw Joan, this backdrop, this sort of desert backdrop. And there was Joan with all these people behind her and some people on either side of her, although a little behind her. And just before I woke, I remember asking, who are those people? And what I heard was, clear as day, the ancestors. So, this gave me the sense of really understanding that deep time and that deep time is a pathway to the future. And a word that I learned, I think I learned it from you, Ben, it's um, didari, which is deep listening. So we as a species, as um, human beings, we're just another species. But when we face all these challenges of uh, climate change and a changing world and changing cultures that we try to solve in a reductionistic way with in silos, here and there and everywhere. What we really need to do is be listening to people like the Aboriginal people and their deep listening. Because until we learn to listen to nature, until we learn to listen to the mountains talk and the waters speak because they're living waters, we won't be able to solve these problems. And I know that in all my heart. So this became sort of a passion of mine that I felt like not only can future Aboriginal generations be informed that their culture has always been sophisticated, that they deserve to be raised up on the, raised up on the global stage. I'm sure there are many other cultures that that will find camaraderie in this story too with their elders who have uh, been uh, treated uh, very poorly. You know, and as Jim, you said in one of your slides, you said the Aboriginal people have very important messages for us. And are we listening? Are we listening to these Aboriginal people? And so it holds also the key for how we treat our elders in general, and both now and after they depart, because they hold keys. They're, as you said, Jenny, in one of the pieces you wrote, they are a vortex to ancient consciousness. And uh, so as a result, I want to be able to bring this story to a larger global audience. And so here we are at World Unity Week. And I do know, and I'm sure one of the bowlers will tell you, there will be a comment period at some point uh, for, to, for the government and the families to decide what happens to uh, these bones. And uh, so I would like to gather people around this story because I think that it's only part of the story and we have yet to learn more of the story. And as Mary said, they came up, not like, Bones were found, but they came up and there will be more of them. And I believe that too. So we have an email now, globalfriendsofmongo at gmail.com. I'll put it in the uh, chat there. And if you'd like to keep up on this story and if you'd like to support the family and all of the, Abori I mean, the Aboriginal families and the Bowler family as they face this challenge to um, honor the remains of Mungo Man and Mungo Lady and keep their story as an important story so that we learn, the rest of the world needs to learn to listen to our ancestors because they're speaking, not just to Aboriginal people, but I'm sure if we listen, ours will speak to us too. Oh, beautiful, thank you, Janice. So, so um, 
it's just wonderful to, to have somebody hearing that, that passion from outside of Australia. And so often it's the international people that come to Australia that are touched by this story because here in Australia, there's so many layers of complexity as, as would be in your own country with these, with these sort of issues. So Jason, let's come back to you and then we'll finish with uh, Vicky closing our water ceremony. We've only got, um, oh, we've probably got about five, seven minutes left. Sure. So we've heard about a bit about the dreaming. We've heard a bit about what Mungo is for us and what Mungo has for, for, for everyone. I'm going to talk a bit about, touch on a bit, a bit, talk speak a bit more about transformation. So like with the dreaming and, and how our relationships are defined through our kinship systems and our relationships to the universe and, and um, the animals, Everyone knows all around the world about the stories about the eagle and the crow, and the eagle and the crow are always, always fighting. Well, this is a story about the freshwater mussels, um, the river mussels and the lagoon and lagake mussels that were caught up in the fights with Wallachal, the eagle, and with Wongi, the, the crow. So, and also <clears throat> gives an understanding about how our, our totems and our animal systems are like talks about how governs our relationships and our, and our marriages because <clears throat> in our in under our law unless you're marrying your equal opposite you will never have a true understanding of the universe so i'm going to talk about um the the, the, the like the, the two halves in, in muddy muddy um it's known as gilpra and, and, Mak and makwa so the story of the muscles relates to um, the time before Gilpra and Makwa became, became law. So it was during a time when Wilaykil, the eagle, and Wangi were fighting. Four men from opposing sides, if they fought each other constantly, um, were mixing themselves up in Wilaykil's and, and Wangi's fight. Eventually, after, after a very long time, Wilaykil and Wangi actually came together and they grabbed the grips and these groups of people that were aligned to either either side of them and only fighting only because one liked one liked to be aligned with the egg with Wangi, one liked to be aligned with with Wilaiko. So <clears throat> Wilaiko and Wangi came came down and they grabbed the two groups and got them together. And Wilaiko grabbed one of the men that was aligned to him and said, You come and stand here and grabbed one from Wangi's side and said, You come and stand here. Now you two will forever come together because they, you know, we use this magic and you will forever come together and you will live in, in the rivers. And Wangi did the same, called one of his over and called one from Wallachil's over and said, you two will also come together and you will live in the lagoons and in the lakes. <clears throat> and the freshwater mussels in... Uh, over here, they look exactly the same, but the river ones are bigger than the lagoon and the um, um, lagoon and the billabongs and th those ones. Same the, in the same way that the eagle and the crow um, are diff different in different in size. So what that was essentially was about was about two two different sides coming together to form one. And that's sort of how it talks about the, so for us, like transformation comes from, from bringing together and understanding and understanding, um, you know, together also sort of fits in with our, with our visions and, and our stories for, for Mungo. It's about bringing our, it's bringing our story together and sharing it with the world and having it as a place for everyone to sort of unite, have that, get that message and receive that message from Mungo and an opportunity for everyone to connect, no matter what your background is. Um, you know, when I went back to the message stick, it talks about we're all brothers and sisters from a global community. It's about us all coming together and connecting to the ancestors. So you heard about our, aspira our, our aspirations and, and our um, what we're sort of trying to, to realise during self-determination. I think one thing that I haven't mentioned yet, but it's really important to note is that when we've been at the table at Mungo, the free traditional tribal groups, like every other tribe or nation in Australia, 
has never ever ceded sovereignty and we never ever will cede sovereignty and that gets lost in what in, in um you know in the way that we we sit at the table when I wrote that letter to the minister and the AAG passed a resolution to do so, we took it back to Orlando Lakes Full Heritage Committee and they informed us that, that it's the government that actually um, we're advisors and it's the government that actually gives us, gives, gives us a seat at the table. We, don't, we, didn't have, they, we were getting directions that we don't have the right to write to the ministers ourselves, but we can come to a decision and then go through the committee and they will write on our behalf. So that's the type of bureaucracy that we're still subjected to. We have the vision for the memorials for Mungo Man and Mungo Lady. We have the vision for the International Education Centre and the keep the keeping place. But beyond that, there's a, there's another vision too. I have the vision of holding biannual international corroborees, just having Mungo as a place for all of our First Nations brothers and sisters for all around the world can come pay their respects to Mungo Man and Mungo Lady and bring their ceremonies and dances with us from all around the world. How amazing would that be? Um, to have those those types of events, these are the visions, these are the aspirations that we have, and these and as sovereign people of the land um, that have and never will see never will see sovereignty, um, I certainly will continue to act like self determination um, already exists. So, thank you, everybody. Wow, that's we're just so grateful that you're here, Jason. Share being able to share that. Um, share your insight and your strength that you have and and the vision that you have it's extraordinary and you know what I think we're getting a whole lot closer and especially as this conversation's opening up and and people like um, Janice and the the community here and World Unity Week just dropping that pebble in a pond Jason you never know where mm. it's going to end up right so I'm sure the energy is going to gather for you let's let's um and it just before you go Jenny just on the uh, back of Jason Jason, also, uh, the wonderful things you were making suggestions about, Jason, and we could dance around the peace pole that we, you, we are going to work towards. Mm -hmm. Aren't we? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, <laughs> Jason. So let's bring Vicky back in just to do a small closing for that water ceremony from the river to, 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 to bring us to a, a closure here. I think if people are still on, we're happy to keep chatting for another 10 minutes, but the live stream will end in a few minutes. Um, so I'll, I'll show Vicky's um, video. And if we all just become conscious of the water that's in the room with us and what it is that you're feeling at this moment. Ah, see, my head's gone now. <laughs> That's what I'm feeling. I'm not in my head. What am I going to do? Okay. Okay. So my final farewell blessing to all my brothers and sisters across the world is the ultimate law that my old people taught me that we as Aboriginal people are equal with the whole of creation. We needed the stars to guide us, the rivers to sustain us, the land for our spiritual base, and our food, our animals to feed us. Our trees gave us our spiritual connection and gave us the signposts for ceremonial places. So the one thing I must do now is we ret return this water back to the riverways. Return the ochre and the gum leaves that I've used for ceremony. So that it continues to nurture the spirit of this land. We are only coexisting with the whole of creation. And may we always remember that we are equal in all of that. So goodbye to my friends across the, across the world. And I hope you've enjoyed some time on the sacred lands of Lake Mungo. Mum, maybe 
would you like to say something in closing or Ben? Ben, well, Jenny, I mean, thank you for putting all that wonderful work together, Jenny, and uh, it, it, with such passion and dedication. Uh, I'm just so grateful to you and also grateful to Ben for Unity Earth and as well for having the opportunity to um, to present to the world this uh, amazing story of these extraordinary people. And uh, I just thank everybody that's presented today and also the audience that uh, are, are with us um, that we go and keep moving forward towards um, good outcomes for the Indigenous people here in Australia and, and around the world. And clearly, Jenny, the, the, the thing to learn is deep listening with, with you know, a, a sense of real awareness of what, what is actually happening. Thank you, and thank you, everybody, for your beautiful words. And Janice, you too. So I think we're going to be bringing this to a close, Tanya, and our gratitude to Ben, um, as so many people would have been saying over these last few days, but he, he well, everything that he has created and and sending love and support to, to all of you. All right. Well done, everybody. Beautiful, beautiful program. Um, I believe that Tanya uh, and Jim are going to allow conversation to continue here. Uh, Tanya, if we could end the live stream.